prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for giving us the pastor to share your word with my brothers and sisters in Christ's community. But it's important, so importantly to honor you, Lord, to realize the grace that you have bestowed upon us. We have salvation through your grace. Only through you, you have shown us sacrifice. You've been our example. We learn from you. Your prayers, your teachings, you have given us in your Bible. May the Holy Spirit move amongst all of us and help us understand, not only intellectually, but spiritually as well. As you continue with our lives, we understand what we are to do with them as we go through this life. of our talk today, the different words that we have here, these three words, sacrifice, suffering, and serving. You know, when I went in there and I read these things, and I was looking at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 19, went reading along that to see that, looked at the entire verse to see what it is, how it spoke to this, to this subject. So, keeping that in the, in the back of our minds here today. Nowadays, we face so many challenges. And back in the olden times, it was exactly the same, the things that they had, same problems that would show up in people's lives. And so nowadays, people think that these are all new problems, but they're not. They're the same old problems that they have had since the beginning of time. And what are the things is it that we face? We love ourselves, the love of ourselves. You know, when we see all these different people and we see the problems that they have, it's because they're so focused on themselves and they overlook all the other people because everything is so focused on me, me, me. You know, you see that when you meet people and you see that this is part of the challenge. And the fact that people are so taken with money, they love money and they don't care about anything else. Boastful people, bragging people, you see that all through the world. And also, the same thing you see people who are so arrogant, who really don't know anything of others. And this word here, the revilers, people who are always against other people, who are always trying to basically kill off other people by their attitude. Children who are disobedient to their parents. And people who are ungrateful for the things that they have, the things that they always have, and they don't thank others for them. And unholy, filthy practices. People who don't love one another. People who are not, whose hearts are not poor towards each other. People who, who are always having fights and who will not reconcile with one another. And gossip, gossip, backstabbing. Always backstabbing against the people. Talking. All of these things here that we see, all of this list, you know, also shows that people, they have no self-control. They just do whatever it is that they want. They don't care about anybody else. You know, it's all about them. They just do it right along. And people who are brutal to one another, they're mean to one another. And no one appreciates the good anymore. Everybody and treacherous people who are deceitful and betraying one another, trying to fool and lie to one another. And reckless people who are always doing wrongdoing. I mean, you see it in traffic where people just pull out in front of you and just speed along at their own at their own pace. And people who are foolish and conceited. And people who prefer the pleasures of the flesh, but they don't care about God just care about their own sin. <coughs> and this one here, often we see this one, that people, people say they're good, they put on a good front, or they look at somebody and they say, oh, he's a really nice person. But within themselves, they are not godly people. They are not good people. You see that throughout the world all the time, where they're, they're good on the outside, they put on a good face, but inside, 
they denied Jesus Christ. Another thing we see that, you know, weak women who want everything and who are sinners as they as they mix with their other women as well. And people who have their own impulses, their own passions, and they are led by themselves. You know, people who are who drink and do drugs and you know they have sexual pleasures that they want to fulfill all the time and they follow all of these impulses. Addiction. Addictions. And then people are always learning or saying or thinking that they're learning. They're always, yes, yes, you know, teach me, teach me, give me everything that I have. But then they don't follow through. They don't they don't have the knowledge of what they have learned. So back in the Old Testament, there were these two men, Janus and Jambres. And the two two of them from Egypt. They were magicians. And they were not followers of Moses. But they were against him. And they were always opposing him. So they also always opposed the truth. You know, the same way it is today where people say that they follow the truth, but they don't really. And people today, they have a depraved mind. It is as if they are blind to what is true. And faithful to Christ? No, they are not. They reject him. But it says that these people will not make further progress. For their foolishness, their folly, which means foolishness, will be clear and obvious to all, just the same as those two men, as Janus and Jambres is. Their folly was obvious to people too. They were not followers of Moses. They were against him. They were always against him. And where can we see about this? We can see this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 9 and 13. We see here, in verse 13 it says, But evil works <coughs> and impostors, people who are crafty, who flatter others, they will proceed from bad to worse. You know, it seems as if they are good, but really it means that they are getting worse and worse and worse. And then what do they do? They go about deceiving other people, trying to fool other people. So there is discussion in, in here, in life. And remember that in our lives, Every day we will face challenges. We will face problems. So what is it that we can do? What is it that we do in this life? Who do we follow? What do we accept? Do we follow God? But let me give you some examples here of things that are going on in the world today. And even in, in the history, all of the problems that have been in history. So we see this, that there was religious persecution. And then people who wanted to come into the United States and wanted to, they were denied this back in the past. Think about this. And then in ancient Greece, you know, if children were deaf, what did they do? They killed them. Killed deaf children. And back in biblical times, you know, based on Romans 10, 17, you know, if they couldn't hear, then they felt, if they couldn't hear, then, then they were denied, they couldn't hear it, so they felt that they could not be saved. And they could not become members of the church because they were deaf. And so they were shunned and they were sent away. And remember him. Remember that terrible time when he was in control <coughs> and he would capture all of these people. You know, and if people were deaf, children were deaf or people were deaf, he would kill them. Dang. Or disabled people as well. He would kill them all. And then in the past also, 
know, back in the 1920s and 1930s, driver's license, the deaf were prohibited from getting driver's license just because they were deaf. Sign language. Sign language was banned, forbidden in the schools in the 1880s. I mean, if you were deaf, you had no way to communicate. Marriage, they were not allowed to marry. Or perhaps they could only marry deaf people. But so many times, they were denied it. They were discriminated against. Discriminated against. Told no, you cannot do this. You cannot have this. <coughs> you know, same as with the black people in all of the struggles that they had with slavery, how they were beaten, how they were persecuted. Same with the deaf people. So we can see this picture of all of these challenges that faced all of these people. And Christians as well, we suffer persecution. <coughs> now, back in the time, in the writings of Peter, and we see all of these, First Peter and Second Peter and all of the things that he wrote about in that time, was it a peaceful time? Was it a good time when everything was pleasant. No, it was not. It was a time of persecution. Because the Romans, the Roman Empire, and the Roman Nero, and everyone, the people who were in control at that time, when they would look about the cities and think about what they were going to do, they would wipe out certain cities, and what would they do? They would blame the Christians. <laughs> when people would complain, they would blame the Christians that this was the reason that it, that it was done. And they were innocent. It was nothing that they were doing. You know, they would blame their God. You hear it now. People blame us, blame the church for everything that's happening. And what do we do? What can we do? How can we handle this? So we look back at this, back in that time. Remember, back in the past time. Christians were scapegoats. They were scattered. They were persecuted. They were maligned. They were spoken against. They were abused. They suffered. Suffered just as Christians suffer today. So nowadays we look, and it's the same. We are to look to Christ. And he suffered. He suffered. God suffered. Christ suffered. God suffered. You remember, he came to this earth, leaving his glory to suffer for us. Suffer on a cross. Crucified on a cross crucified for us that we might experience salvation. So think of that. That Christ gave up his own life. Sacrifice was what he did. <coughs> so we have this picture in our mind. And we can read in First Peter. Chapter 4, verses 1 to 2. So it says, now, therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, it says, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Verse 2, that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men. When you read this, it may seem a little confusing. So we see this word, suffering. Christ came to suffer as he grew up as a small child. He suffered throughout his life. He went to the cross and suffered death. A horrible death. So it says, arm yourself. And what do you mean? It means to be ready. all of these challenges that we are prepared <coughs> to be of a same mind means to be united together it says for he <coughs> who suffered he 
people who have already suffered. So the he refers to people who have all of us who have suffered. So the result is that we should no longer be doing things of the flesh, but doing things of God. So when we focus on the things of the flesh, no, we should turn to God. We should look to Him. Verse 2 here, where it says that he should no longer should live the rest of his time. Meaning that once we are saved, we do not continue in sin as the world continues in sin. For the lust of death. For the will of God. Those things of the flesh follow the things of the world. And we are to turn to the will of God. Here in verse 3 it says, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime <coughs> in doing the will of the Gentiles. The Gentiles, remember, the Gentiles were the sinners. They were the people connected to the world. They would go their own way. They had sins of pride and lust, all of these different things. And then what did they do? There's a list. So they did acts of lewdness, conducting violence, lusts, drunkenness, alcoholism, addiction. They had revelries that were like drunken feasts. And then drinking parties the same. And then it says abominable, illegal idolatry. They worshipped idols or images. You know, remember, addictions are the same as that. They are like idols. They can be that. All of the things that are considered addictions are like our own idols. So our thinking in the past that things were not the same and that things are different and how today, you know, people spend money on parties and on all of these things and they just spend all of their time, day and night, pouring themselves in into these, these lusts of the time. It's the same as in the olden times. It is. <coughs> but we are to have a new life in Christ. We are not to be to be looking to these things of the world. You know, because in the old life, this is what we did. But as a new person, we are to look at the will of God and do the will of God. Now in verse 4, it says that some people, some people don't care. They don't seem to care that this is going on. And what it means is that, here, it says that in all of this, you know, salvation, <coughs> when one has been saved, it says that these people are surprised that you are still not connected to the world, that you do not run with them into the excesses of dissipation, you know, going about and doing all of the things that the world does, all of the activities of the world. All of those things. You have stepped back from that. So all of the old people are thinking that you should still be involved and you're not. They are surprised at your new life. Because once you have been saved, you look and you see that sin is not what you want. Because you have become holy. You have been made holy by God. And the sins of the world are darkness separate yourself from them. So you can no more join in with the world. No more go back to be with them. You are to become a part. And these people are sons that you do not want to be with them anymore. For example, in my family, in my family, you know, we go out to the door. You know, we party from time to time. But since we have been saved, we don't bother with that anymore. I'd be invited and people would be surprised. They'd say, you're such a different person now. And it's like all of us. When we have become saved, we do become different people. And others are thinking, well, you don't do what you used to do. You are different. So it, it, it speaks to these people and says, what do they do? Do they support you in your new life? Do they say, good job? You know, you have, you have done really well. No. <coughs> these people are against you. They mock you. It says here, they malign you. So when we look to the second list, it says, the people that are, they are surprised. And 
they will hate you. They will hate you. You know, when you have friends, you know, you invite people over for a party and they go and they say, come on, you can come, it's no big deal, just come, we can have a little bit of drinking or something, you know, whatever. You know, they try to tempt you and you have to resist that. You have to resist that and say, no, I can't. <coughs> I serve the Lord now. I serve the Lord now. I am saved. But once you've served the Lord, you cannot go back to the old life of darkness. They will tempt you. They will try to drag you into that. And they'll beg you. They'll say, come on. Come to this. Or, you know, what else do they do? They want to be careful of that. And they will mock you. They'll mock you. Oh, you church person. You know, you go to church all the time. And then what else will they do? They will watch you to see the first time that you fail. And this makes them happy. This gets them all excited because you've made a mistake. <coughs> so it's hard for people to understand when you make things. Because, you know, we do cherish our friends. We cherish our families. We do. But we cannot cherish them the same way when we have accepted Christ. Because Christ sacrificed more like him. We cannot put him away. We cannot say, no, I, I really want to go to those parties with my families and friends. We don't do that anymore. We must sacrifice our desires that when we may be like him, we cannot serve two masters. You cannot have them both. You cannot flip from side to side. Serving two masters is impossible. It's either God or money. Remember? That's what they said. You cannot serve God nor can you serve men. You must choose one who you will follow who you will sacrifice for, who you will serve, and who you will bear all things for, and that will be God. <coughs> but you to study this for a bit. And we have written here a comfort zone, you know, something we're used to. Uh, look at change. And, uh, I like where I'm at. Or, Step out and change. Go through this. It's something new. There will be struggle. There will be. And you'll have some tough times. And it won't be a smooth ride, no, but it will be exciting. Bumpy be ride. But you know, it's up to you which path you take. And Christ will be bumpy as well. Peter, tough time. So we have two categories here, church, death world. In the past, we've talked about <coughs> injustice against the deaf. You know, suppose the deaf were to accept the uh, dominance of the hearing uh, world leaders. Uh, that's kind of like an example of in the comfort zone. You know, you can't uh, sign, you have to follow the oral, oral uh, teaching, uh, oppression, and told you constantly that you can't do this and that. Uh, well, people just know. Deffer is no different than anyone else. They want to drive. They want to be able to communicate. And, you know, they have desires. So you have a choice, though. You accept this... Uh, Justice, or do you move and try to go your own way? <laughs> follow the Lord, follow his teachings, not of the ways of the world. As a Christian, you don't go with the ways of the world, or, or as a free man, a deaf man in a hearing world, you don't follow that, you stand up for yourself. It goes throughout <coughs> things, the key to all this. Sacrifice of an animal and you get forgiven. And then your sacri sacrifice as a Christian is to serve, to obey the Lord, to lo love Him with all of your heart, and to show love. This is love <laughs> sacrifice. And then in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, what it explains what sacrifice means for us. 
Christians. So this person here, J. I. Packer, who is well known a theologian, he's still a thinker, and he put this down for us to contemplate. Christians often imagine themselves to be strong, healthy, and holy. This is a self-image many Christians have, but the true way, the way to help is to recognize that we are weak, <coughs> sick, and sinful. We come to God. We need to realize this. This is an example of sacrifice. You know, the priests, when they would give their sacrifice, and they would give the fact that he is so much better than others, and I give such a tithing, and I do this right and that right. And God looks at this and is not pleased with this. That is not the sacrifice. And then there was another person there at the same time, a poor man who was humbled himself, not boastfully approaching God, and, but in remission or acknowledgement that he was a sinner. And this is the type of person that Christ, God loves. I encourage you to, to look at this. I, I found this this morning and I added it. Verse here, First Samuel. Chapter 15, verse 22. Speaks, uh, Samuel said, As the Lord better to obey the sacrifice. Samuel said, as the Lord has much like the burnt offerings and sacrifices, <coughs> as in obeying the voice of the Lord, the word of the Lord. So, God, you know, the sacrifices and the listening are listening to his orders and obeying them. So, behold, to obey is better than his attention. He, he prefers to listen to his word. <coughs> his word as opposed to following tradition of sacrifice. The animals and the the past. And in Romans 12, 1 through 2, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercy of God, to present your body as a living and holy sacrifice. That doesn't mean you kill yourself to God. No, it's not saying that. Sacrifice yourself. What ways of the world separate yourself from Him and solely focus on God and serve <coughs> service of worship. And God wants your worship. He wants you truth. He doesn't want you to face. Remember, he sees all. He can see in your hearts. He can see in your minds. He can. So spiritually, he wants you to be focused upon him. Worship with him. Verse 2, not only that, and do not be conformed to this world. But to be transformed by the new renewing of the renewing of your mind. Instead of being focused on things of this world, you focus your attention heavenly. <coughs> so that you may prove.
prove that the will of God is what he desires, you work. This is how others will know. Because you have focused all of your attention on what God wants, not of the ways of the world. That which is good and acceptable. Acceptable and perfect. I'd like to go into a little more about sacrifice and what that truly means for a Christian. Exercise, work hard, sweat. <coughs> what is this? How does this pertain? To keep your health. Good standing. Exercise. What do you do the exercises for? Why would one want to do it? Exert themselves. It's for your health. The main goal is for your health. So this is sac sacrifice we do. <coughs> work, and hour trips, all this effort to support yourself, your family, provide food for your family, you know, pay the bills, necessary bills, to keep your family unit in good shape. This is why you work, that's the goal of mine, to sacrifice the work. Spending money or, or work for what? Things of this world, things that please you. Uh, examples might be drugs or partying or seeking riches. This is the wrong way. There's many, good many people, but that's all they can think about. They desire that and that alone. But we, or the individual who seeks that, only that. not the one that seeks God's desires. So again, we talk about God's will. <coughs> what does that mean for you, God's will? Be true. Be loving. Reject the world in the sinful ways. And for you to suffer for him. Let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of the lips that acknowledge his name. Whether to do what to do good for, what to look at, what to ignore. It says, do not neglect to do good <coughs> and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God.
So what does God want of us? He wants us to look to him, but what precisely does he want? Praise. Continue to praise God. To give him honor, to give him praise, to thank him for coming to this earth for us. Praise him. To ask for forgiveness of sins every day. Every day we are to do these things, regardless of when we fail. We turn to God still and we ask for forgiveness as we praise him. So the fruit of the lips, what on earth does this mean? It also refers to words, to do things cleanly, holily, purely. And then it says, do not ignore good. And share what you have. This would mean to fellowship and to help one another. Not to be a cold person and to just go about their own business. But to share with people, to work with them. Give them what you have. Give them of your time. Because God wants us. You have time. God wants us to give of our time to others. So, serve. Sacrifice to serve. People would say, let's see. All of the things that God wants us to do, he wants us to sacrifice. He wants us to serve. So it says, the end of all things is near. Christ is coming again, right? And the time is, is getting shorter to this time when it will happen. And what are we to do during this time? It says, to be of sound judgment and of sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. And when we look to the other column, we see these different things. Our sacrifice is to sound judgment. What does that mean? It means self-control. To, to look at the ways of whether something is right or whether it's wrong, whether to accept it, whether to put it aside, to think of these things, to make good judgment as to what we are going to do. A sober spirit it means to remain calm. And the result of this, what will we do? Will be our prayers. So if we are continuing to sin in this world, what we need to do is prayer. Because sin prevents us from God, but prayer brings us closer to God. So we need to look to Him, to focus on Him in prayer. And God is pleased with this. He is pleased with our prayers. It says, above all, remain fervent in your love for one another. Because love covers a multitude of sins. So above all, the most important of all, and I want to impress this upon you, is love. <coughs> Meaning that when we serve, when we do it, we love God. We show we love. When we are enthusiastic about what we do, not like, oh, yes, sure, I'll get this done, or whatever. No, we, our love is shown in what we do. Fervent. This word is fervent. Really good word. But it shows that we need to have a fire in our hearts for what we do. This fire shows the love that we have to be eager and to be active. Show this love to one another. Now love has wonderful benefits. Love, it says, covers a multitude of sins. It's not saying that this is good, or that sin is good, or whatever, but it's what it's saying is that love shows a repentance. You know, Love doesn't go about talking about the sins or discussing about the sins of one another. It means that love covers a multitude of sins. A multitude of sins. You know, to have discussion, to speak of this with the person, you know, brothers and sisters of Christ, to speak to God of these things and to show this love. Because as he loved us, God did not go through the world discussing and showing the sins of the world. His love covered our sins. love is patient and love is kind. These are the wonderful benefits of love. Now in 1 John chapter 3, 14, uh, it's, uh, it says 3, 14b, you know, looking at the lines and how the lines are laid out, 
they said, he who does not love <coughs> abideth in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and no murderer has eternal life. So what this is saying and what this is meaning is that we cannot hate one another and love God. shows this fervent activity of love. Meaning that no matter what, you know, it shows that you can enjoy and have the joy of love no matter who people are, no matter what place you're in. You know, maybe if you go someplace where or you don't know people, you, never, you don't know people at all, you can still be hospitable to them. You know, welcome people to the church. When you see new people Welcome again. Go and say hi. Say hello. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Now, this particular verse is interesting as well. It speaks to all of the people. You know, everyone. It says all. So it says, as each one has received from the Lord a special gift. A special gift. Employ it in serving one another. So that means, you know, we can serve one another. I can serve this individual. You can serve this individual. We can all help one another. So, for instance, you know, a husband and a wife, for example, you know, with the give and take of a marriage that you have, you know, you go to the people at church, you can do the same thing. You can, you can welcome them in. So this serving, this fellowship, is a service to one another. So it says here, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The grace of God can be given to anyone. Now it says here, whosoever speaks, whichever one of you speaks, is to do so as one who is speaking. Like when you're teaching or when you're sharing the gospel, whatever, speaking, <coughs> those that are skilled in, in, in one talent or another and someone who's skilled in another one can do so. And it says in all things God will be glorified through the things that we do. But we do them for Jesus Christ or through Jesus Christ. So this one over on this side says that 
look at all of these um, <coughs> different skills that people have. So all of these, anything that you have, any skills that you have is service to God. So if you have a, a, a skill for speaking, for talking, all of this. And it's not that you do it so that you can get a pat on the back. Or it's glorifying God, not glorifying yourself. Service, suffering. You know, a lot of people don't want to speak about suffering. You know, they want to have a wonderful attitude, have life go beautifully, have everything work out the way that it should. They don't want things to go poorly. You know, really, they don't want to do that. They don't want to sacrifice themselves. This verse here, this verse here, is a little bit different. So I'll explain it just a little bit. So people, people like to blame. They like to blame things that go wrong. So you know, blame Christians. You know, even though they may be innocent, you know, in Isaiah, you know, they wanted to blame Joseph. They wanted to blame Joseph. But what it what to do? You know, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord is what we do. Whatever happens, accept it. Don't go and talk about it and get all upset about it and get angry about it and try to blame and put something somewhere. Just accept it. So it says here when you keep continuing reading down this verse, so no matter what happens, you know, say not to say, I didn't do anything. You know, I didn't, you know, I'm wrongfully accused, I'm innocent. You know, like Christ, we can be like him. You know, don't get all upset when people blame you, just accept it and suffer. For God. Accept the suffering for him. Because God will see. God knows. God remembers. And God will help us. So as we continue to read on down this, you know, people, you know, get upset about all the bad things that are happening and saying, you know, Lord, you know I'm innocent. You know, you saw. You see right. And they want to blame other people as well. We should just be joyful in our sufferings because God knows us. God knows what's going on. Things that people cannot see, God sees, and God knows. So we should continue joyfully in our lives. So the test you see in this other column over here. And then this other one says to rejoice. It's difficult to do that sometimes. You know, depending on you know the trial or what's going on, because they all vary. But we are to trust in the Lord, and we are to continue in rejoicing, continue to be joyful and be happy, no matter what happens. This is what we are to do. All of us, each and every one of us, continue to do this. And we are to show God's glory. You know, people that blame things, or they look at you, or they want to blame things, and you continue to be happy, and you continue to serve God, it shows the glory, and then and then they're stuck. They don't know what to do. Because we know that for eternity we will live with God forever. So what happens here on earth is shown. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Do not be surprised. Do not be surprised that the world hates you. The world blames you because you are a Christian. It will happen. It will happen. And we know know that it will happen, and we should trust in the Lord and continue to rejoice. So when people insult us or hurt us or revile us, what do we do? We continue to be happy because we are blessed from God. You know, all the things that happen, the tumult in our lives, we are to accept it. We are to rest in God, in Christ. Because he will give us the comfort that we need. So in Matthew 5.11 it says, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you. And falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Christ said this. So again, be happy. Be rejoicing because of our blessing. And the reason is
is because our motivation keeps us going. So this speaks to shame. You know, as a Christian, you know, you want to keep it secret. You don't want to tell anybody about it. That's shameful. Are you ashamed to be a Christian? No, we should not do that. We are to announce who we are when we meet people. Say, hello, how are you? I haven't seen you for a long time. What have you been up to? You know, working and going to church and doing stuff. Church, you? You can go to church. And some people get all embarrassed about it, and we're not to do this. We are to be happy to each other. Yeah, I've been going to church, been serving at my church. It doesn't matter if people look at you and ignore you and let you go. Just forget about what they're saying because we are not to do that. We are not to experience shame for being Christian. We are to be proud that we are Christians because we are one with God. <coughs> now, here's something. Should we spread the news or should we quiet about it so that people don't look at us and don't and and don't come to us? We should share the news. Preach the gospel. Not sit and be quiet because we're so embarrassed about it or because we're ashamed. We pray to God. Help me stand. Help me. Help me to stand. So share or don't share. And then we do this. We do this for God's glory. <coughs> so it says, now, give the children your time. Here we go. It says, the reason, what, what, for what reason should we be happy at Pete Joy? You know, because the world is so negative. So why should we continue to do this? Why should we? Because we will have an eternity in heaven with new glory. Those people who denied and who shunned Jesus Christ, where are they going? They are going to go to hell. You know, to have people say, oh, they are mock me and they're just not nice to me and they're mean to me. We should rejoice because we know what we have. We have a heavenly home with God and we will be there with him in his glory. And the other people, in a short time, they will all be gone. So we know what, when people come at you and, and are going to you, we can continue to preach the gospel to them. Because we have a short time to do it in. Why? It doesn't matter what they bring back at us. We don't pay them back in kind. Because what is going to happen to them, perhaps we may touch a heart. Perhaps they too will know the joy and the glory. Even though they mocked you at first and whatever, you continue in your joy and rejoice that they say that, maybe these people, their hearts will be touched. We don't know. We don't know. Perhaps they will be saved. So we are to give our testimony of our experiences. Tell our stories of love. Tell about the joy that we have in our hearts because that is the work of God. And that is what we are to do. Because we know that we will have an eternity. So we're to suffer and we are to bear the persecution negative attitude, the backstabbing, everything that people can throw at us, because we know that we are one with Jesus Christ. So, looking at this, both the good and the bad will face judgment, both. What will the good do? They will be taken up into heaven in their judgment. They will be given the, their reward. There will be no misunderstanding about this name of Christ and on judgment day, this reward will be, he will give them out to the Christians. He will say, come, he will say, good work, good work, servant. All that you did on earth, you did, you served. Now, the judgment for those, and Christ sits on his throne, on his white throne. For those people who are not saved, who did not study the Bible, who did not eat it, who are not in the book of life, what will happen to them. Remember, both will be judged. They will be. God will judge them all. But it's important to know that since we have Christ in our hearts, that we have him as our Savior, that we have believed in him, in his death and in his resurrection, and we have salvation because of this, and we know that we will go to our home in heaven after we have faced the judgment. He gives us a reward. 
those that don't know Christ, those that don't have Jesus Christ and never knew him, they will be going down forever. We will be with Christ forever in glory. So as a conclusion, these three things, sacrifice, suffering, and service to God. So if you do not sacrifice, if you give up nothing, What if Christ had never sacrificed for us? Where would we be today? So we should ask him, what do we? He came to this earth. What did he come to do? He came to suffer. He came to serve. Christ did that for us. And what should we do? We should be the same. We should serve. We should sacrifice. We should be patient with our suffering. All of us. This is our turn. This is what we do through all of the problems of life. We should go on and we should do this trusting in Christ, Him and Him alone. So, let me say to you, if there is no suffering and there is no service, if there is a conflict in your life, in 1 Peter 4, 2 it says, so as to live the rest of the time in flesh, no longer for the lust of man, but for the will of God. To give up, to serve God, or not to. So when we are saved, salvation requires that we go through service, suffering, and we will do this. This will happen in our lives. And this last verse from 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse 9. It says, therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Suffering, sa sacrifice, suffering, and serving all come down to this verse. It's very clear. Coin. You know, on a coin, separation, just as there is no separation of these three things. Sacrifice, suffering, and serving. We need to do this, and we need to be willing to do this. We need to be willing to do this because we meet that church. We meet his terms. When we meet his terms, not our own, not our own time, not our own preferences, not our schedule, his schedule. This last one in closing, this closing verse, it says, Chester Brock, we were recently read this, and he said that Jesus said, deny yourself, take the cross, and follow me. And the cross is a picture, or an example, of sacrifice, of suffering, and of service. Amen. <coughs> Amen. In prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, give to all of us comfort. Give to all of us an eagerness and a fire, a motivation in our hearts for sacrifice, for service, for suffering. All of these things, Lord, we pray to you and ask you for your help that you will give us courage. Leave our, let us leave our comfort zone and let us begin to live for you, to go through all of the things that we go through the ups and the downs of our lives, no matter what happens, Lord, whatever is given to us, give us the strength and the energy that we need and the fire in our hearts and the love for one another, this motivation so that we don't give up. And all of this time, the time for the problems, all of the things that we see and all of the people around so that we all face different, different sins, different evils that are becoming worse and worse in time. Let us those that are being persecuted, those of us that are put down, those of us that suffer. Lord, give us the strength that we need that we may not be put down by other people, but that we may show love, that we may show a service, that we may joyfully do this, whatever happens, no matter who comes at us. Help us, Lord. Help us to stand strong. In 
we pray for blessing on all of these people's hearts, that they may trust in you. And let this blessing go on through the years. Let us continue our service. Let us continue to be patient with our suffering and whatever happens. We thank you, Lord, for everything, everything. And we thank you that Jesus Christ has been an example to us, showing us what to do, that we may understand his sacrifice on the cross. And this may be clear that his love for us was tremendous, that he came to serve. We want to be like Christ. And we thank you, Lord.